section twenty five of obermann this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org obermann by etienne pivert de senancourt translated by arthur edward waite eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two sixth year letter thirty eight Lyon, may eighth six i have journeyed as far as blamont to call on the surgeon who was so skilful in setting a certain officer's arm when he fell from his horse on his return from chassel on the occasion in question more than twelve years ago you will not have forgotten how as we entered his house he ran out into the garden to gather his choicest apricots and on how on returning with hands full the old man then already infirm caught his foot against the doorstep and so upset nearly the whole of the fruit you will remember also how rudely his daughter cried to him that is just what you do every day you will interfere with everything and it is only to spoil everything can't you sit still in your chair here is a pretty state of things our hearts bled for he was in pain and made no answer poor fellow to-day he is even more unfortunate he is stretched by paralysis on a veritable bed of sorrows with no one near him except this wretched creature his daughter it is several months since he lost the power of speech but his right arm is not affected as yet and he can use it to make signs he made one which to my sorrow it was not possible for me to explain he was anxious that his daughter should offer me some refreshment but as often happens she did not understand him when at length he recalled her to some other business i took the opportunity to make her unhappy father comprehend that there was one at least who sympathized with his misfortunes his hearing is still very fair and he gave me to understand in return that his daughter believing his end close at hand denied him everything that could diminish by a few pence the considerable heritage which he leaves her but though his afflictions were many that he forgave her all so that in his last moments he might still cherish an affection for the one being who remained to his love thus does an aged man behold his life flicker out amidst such bitterness does a father end his days in his own house and our laws are powerless such an abyss of wretchedness affects necessarily the sentiment of immortality were it possible that after reaching the age of reason i had been seriously wanting towards my father i should be unhappy through all my life because he is no more and hence my fault would be no less irreparable than monstrous it might certainly be argued that he who feels no longer who exists no more is chimerical so to speak and in a certain sense of no account as are all things wholly passed away i could scarcely deny it and yet i should be inconsolable notwithstanding it is difficult to ascertain the ground of this sentiment were it nothing but the consciousness of a degrading lapse whence we have lost the opportunity of rising with a dignity which might inwardly console us we should find at least a certain compensation in the sincerity of the intention where our own self-esteem is exclusively concerned the desire of a praiseworthy action must stand for us in place of its execution the latter differs from the desire only by its consequences and there can be none for an ill-used person who lives no longer the sentiment of that injustice which in its effects subsists no more can still we find overwhelm us still debase us still lacerate us as though it had eternal results one would say that the person we have aggrieved is merely absent and that we are destined to re-establish the ties between us but in some state which will suffer no further change in anything no reparation of anything and wherein the wrong will be perpetuated in spite of our remorse ever does the human mind lose itself in speculating upon this connection between things effectuated and their unknown issues it might be imagined that these conceptions of a future order and an unlimited perpetuation of present things have no other bases 
than the possibility of supposing them that they must be counted amongst the instruments by which man is preserved in diversity in contrariety in permanent incertitude plunged therein by his imperfect discernment of the qualities and interconnection of things since my letter has not been sealed i must quote montaigne i have just chanced on a passage so analogous to the idea which occupied me that i have been impressed and convinced thereby in such conformity of thoughts there is a principle of secret joy it is this which renders man indispensable to man fertilizing our ideas giving assurance to our imagination and confirming us in the opinion of what we are we do not find what we seek in montaigne we come across what is there he must be opened by accident and to mention this is to pay a certain homage to his manner which is full of independence without being burlesque or artificial and i am not surprised that some englishman has set the essays above everything montaigne has been reproached for two things which make him worthy in reality of admiration and for which i should never have occasion to exonerate him as between you and me he says in the eighth chapter of his second book as i know by an abundant experience there is no consolation so sweet amidst the loss of our friends as that which is afforded us by the knowledge that we have left nothing unsaid to them and that a perfect and undivided confidence has subsisted between us such plenary communion with a responsible being similar to ourselves and placed near us in a revered connection seems an essential part of the mission which is bestowed on us for the employment of our allotted span we are discontented with ourselves when at the end of the act we have lost beyond recall the merit of the execution in the episode entrusted to ourselves this you will possibly tell me is evidence that we are conscious in advance of another existence i grant you but we shall also acknowledge that the dog who will no longer bear the burden of life because life has ceased for his master and hence leaps on the pyre where the body of the latter is being consumed is eager to die with him because he is convinced of immortality and possesses the consoling assurance of rejoining him in another world i have no wish to laugh at anything which it is sought to set up in place of despair but i should jest if this restraint were removed the confidence with which man cherishes the opinions which please him though in directions where there is nothing to be discerned compels respect in so far as it may diminish the bitterness of his woes yet there is something humorous in this religious inviolability with which he pretends to surround it if any one argued that a person might cut the throat of his father without committing a crime we should not term it sacrilege but should incarcerate him in a madhouse without any sense of indignation yet we become furious if one dared to tell us that we may perhaps perish like an oak or a fox so afraid are we of believing it can we fail to see that we are demonstrating our own incertitude our faith is as false as that of those devotees who would raise a cry of impiety if any one questioned that the eating of a chicken on friday could plunge the soul into hell and yet eat it in secret such is the proportion between the dread of eternal torment and the pleasure of a few mouthfuls of meat in anticipation of sunday why not give over to each individual free fancy the things at which it can laugh and even the hopes that all cannot entertain equally morality would be substantially the gainer by abandoning the support of an ephemeral fanaticism in favour of dignified dependence upon indisputable evidence if we would have principles which appeal to the heart let us recall those which are in the heart of every well-organized man let us say in a world of mingled pleasures and sadness the vocation of man is to increase the consciousness of joy to stimulate overflowing energy and to combat in all which feels the principle of degradation and of sorrows End of section 25。section 26。of Obermann。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。
please visit LibriVox.org. Obermann by Etienne Pierre Senancourt Translated by Arthur Edward Waite 1857-1942 to Sixth Year, The Third Fragment On Romantic Expression and The Rans des Vaches Ardent and florid imaginations are captivated by the Romanesque. The Romantic suffices alone to profound souls and veritable sensibility. Nature is full of romantic effects in simple places, but they are destroyed by long culture in old countries, above all on the plains, which are made subject so easily and completely to the will of man. Such romantic effects are the tones of a language which is not intelligible to all, and is indeed quite foreign in many countries. We cease very soon to understand them, when we no longer live in their midst, and yet this romantic harmony is the one thing only which preserves to our hearts the hues of youth and the freshness of life. The society man, conscious no longer of effects which are too remote from his ways, ends by saying, What do they matter to me? His state is similar to that of some constitutions which are worn out by the desiccating fire of a slow and constant poison. He discovers himself to be old already in the prime of his life, with the springs of his being relaxed, though he preserves the outward semblance of a man. But all you who are identified with him in the minds of the vulgar, merely because you live in simplicity and are possessed of genius, though you do not lay claim to wit, or it may be even because they observe that you live and, like him, are accustomed to eat and sleep. You primitive men, scattered here and there in this vain age, to preserve the traces of natural things, you recognize and understand one another in a language which is utterly unknown to the crowd. When the October sun rises clothed in mists over the yellowing woods, when a tiny streamlet flows and falls at moonset in a meadow ringed by trees, when under the summer sky on a cloudless day there sounds at a little distance the voice of a woman in the early morning, amidst the walls and roofs of a great city. Picture a white and limpid surface of water, vast and yet circumscribed, its oblong and slightly curved shape stretching towards the winter sunset elevated peaks, majestic mountain chains, enclose it on three sides. You are seated on the slope of the mountain, above the northern margin of the water, whereon the waves wash and from which they recede incessantly. There are sheer rocks behind you, rising into the cloud regions. No piercing polar wind breathes ever on this happy shore. The mountains open on your left, a quiet valley stretching between their depths. A torrent descends from the snowy summits which encompass it, and when the morning sun seems to take up its place between those frozen peaks above the region of the mists, when the mountain voices indicate the places of the chalets high over meadows which are still steeped in darkness, it is the awakening of a primeval land, it is a monument of our misconstrued destinies. Here now are the first nocturnal moments, time of rest and of sublime sadness. The valley is vaporous, it is beginning to darken, it is night already on the southern side of the lake. The rocks which shut it in form a black belt under the frozen dome which crowns them, but the ice of that dome seems still to retain the daylight. The last gleams gild the chestnuts which flourish in abundance among the wild rocks. They glance in long shafts under the high branches of the alpine fir. They burnish the mountain sides. They kindle the snows. They inflame the air. And the waveless water, all brilliant with the light and merging into the sky, becomes infinite like that itself and purer still, more ethereal, more beautiful. Its peace amazes, its limpidity deceives, the aerial splendor which it images seems to penetrate its depths, 
and beneath those mountains, cut off as it would seem from the globe, and hanging in the atmosphere, you discover at your feet the void of heaven and all the vastness of the world. It is a time of enchantment, and nepenthe, the place of the sky and of the mountains, that which itself bears up, all these are lost to us. The level and the horizon, these are also lost. A change comes over the conceptions of the mind. Unknown sensations are experienced. You have come forth out of common life. And when the darkness has enwrapped that valley of the waters, when objects and distances are discerned no longer, when the waves are stirred up by the evening wind, when the western end of the lake remains alone illuminated by a pallid gleam, but all which the mountains encompass is only an indistinguishable gulf, and in the midst of the darkness and the silence, a thousand feet beneath you, there is heard the continuous insistence of the waves, passing yet never ceasing, vibrating at equal intervals upon the margin, rushing in among the rocks, breaking upon the bank, and seeming to resound with prolonged murmurs in the invisible abyss. It is in sounds that nature has instilled her strongest expression of the romantic character. It is more than all in the sense of hearing that extraordinary places and things are made palpable by a few touches and in a forcible manner. Scents give rise to perceptions which are swift and immense, yet vague. Those of sight seem to concern the mind rather than the heart. We admire what is seen, but we feel rather what is heard. The voice of a beloved woman is still more beautiful than her features. The sounds which are peculiar to sublime places cause deeper and more lasting impressions than their forms. I do not know any picture of the Alps which realizes them so vividly as a truly Alpine melody. That which is so celebrated under the name of the Rans de Vache does not simply excite memories. It may rather be said to paint. Rousseau asserts the opposite, but I think him mistaken. Here is no imaginary effect. I know of two people who, turning over independently the engravings of the tableau picturesque de la Suisse, both exclaimed at the sight of the Grimsel, that is the place in which to hear the Rans des Vaches. When rendered with justice rather than with skill, when felt truly by him who is playing it, the first strains transport us to the high valleys, hard by naked rocks of reddish gray, under the cold sky and the burning sun. We are on the brow of rounded summits, covered with pastures. The slow movements, the scenic grandeur, enthrall us. We see the peaceable progress of cows, and the measured swaying of their great bells close against the clouds. On the gently sloping expanse between the crest of the immovable granite rocks and the granite detritus of the snowy ravines, the wind moans austerely among larches far away. There may be heard the roll of the torrent hidden in the precipices which it has hollowed through centuries. To these isolated sounds succeed the accents of the cowherds, at once rapid and heavy, the nomadic utterance of a pleasure which is removed from gaiety of a mountain joy. The songs cease, the man loiters away, the bells have passed the larches. Nothing is now audible but the clatter of falling pebbles and the fitful crash of trees which the torrent carries down to the valleys. The wind takes far or near these alpine noises, and when it drowns them, all seems cold, motionless, and dead. The domain of man is alone devoid of ardor. He issues from beneath his low and ample roof, shielded from the storms by heavy stones. Whether the sun is burning, the wind strong, or the thunder rolling at his feet, he does not know. He takes the direction where he expects to find the cows. They are there. He calls them. They muster and approach successively. He returns at the same slow pace, laden with milk intended for plains that are unknown to him. The cows pause and graze. There is no longer any visible movement. There are no longer men. The air is cold. The wind has died with the light of evening. 
there remains only the glow of the age-long snows, and the fall of the waters, with their savage roaring, seem to deepen the unchanging silence of the high peaks, and the glaciers, and the night. End of section 26「Section 27 of Obermann. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Obermann by Etienne Piver de Senancourt, translated by Arthur Edward Waite, 1857 to 1942. Sixth Year, Letters 39 and 40 letter thirty nine lyon may eleven six whatever species of attraction exists in the legion of correspondences which bind each individual to his species and to the universe in the comprehensive appeal that is made to the youthful heart by a whole creation open to his experiment by this unknown and fantastic external world all such charm is pallid evanescent already vanished offered to the activity of my own being this earthly scene has become barren and nude i searched for the life of the soul therein but it held it not beneath the moist drapery and vaporous enchantment of morning i have seen the valley gradually illuminated amidst its shadows how beautiful it was i have seen it change and fade the consuming day-star passed over it inflaming and outwearying it with its glare leaving it parched aged and painful in its sterility thus is lifted lightly and thus dissipated the pleasant veil of our days there are no longer those half-lights those secret spaces which it is so delightful to explore there are no more dubious transparencies whereon the eye can rest all is arid and exhausting as the sand which flames beneath the sky of the sahara bereft of this vestment all objects of life offer with repellent realism the exact and mournful mechanism of their naked skeleton with continual inevitable irresistible motions they hurry me away without interesting me and disturb without assisting me to live here are so many years during which evil threatens impends gathers and settles if misfortune at least should not come to break the unvaried weariness all this must needs finish letter forty lyon may fourteen six i was in the valley of the Saone, behind that long wall where we wandered of old together speaking of tinian as we came out of childhood when we aspired after happiness when we thought to live again i contemplated that river flowing past as in those former days that sky of autumn as tranquil as beautiful as in those times of which nothing remains a carriage was approaching i drew aside unconsciously and continued walking my eyes fixed upon the dry leaves which the wind hurried over the dry grass and amidst the dust of the road the carriage stopped and i recognized madame d therein accompanied by her daughter of six years old i took a seat in the vehicle and accompanied her to her country house which however i refused to enter you are aware that madame d is not yet twenty-five years of age but that she is greatly changed notwithstanding she speaks however with the same simple and perfect grace and her eyes if they are more sorrowful are not less beautiful in their expression we said nothing of her husband you will remember that he is her senior by thirty years and belongs to that class of financier who is deeply versed in money matters but a cipher in everything else unfortunate woman here is indeed a life lost and yet fortune seemed to promise her such happiness was she wanting in anything which deserves felicity or should constitute the felicity of another what vivacity what soul were hers what purity of intention and yet all these are useless it is nearly five years since i saw her i returned in her carriage to the town but alighted near the spot where we had met and remained there till a late hour 
as i was about to re-enter the house an old and feeble man who seemed to be overwhelmed by wretchedness approached and looked at me attentively he spoke to me by name and entreated my assistance i failed to recognize him for the moment but was overcome when i found that he was that identical third form professor who was so painstaking and so kind i made some inquiries this morning but know not whether i shall succeed in tracing him to the miserable garret where he is doubtless ending his days the poor fellow will have thought me unwilling to acknowledge him if i find him he must have a decent room and some books to restore him to his old ways so placed i think he will do very well i know not what i may promise him on your part bear in mind that here is no question of temporary help but of all his remaining life i shall do nothing till i receive your instructions i verily believe that i had spent over an hour deciding in which direction i should take a short walk though the place in question is further from my abode i seem to have been drawn thither apparently by the need of some sadness in harmony with that which already possessed me i should have declared without hesitation that we were destined to meet no more indeed the firm resolution had been taken and yet though obscured by discouragement by time and even by the diminution of my own confidence in affections too delusive or fruitless her image is intimately connected with the sentiment of my existence and my duration in the midst of external things i behold her within me but rather as the imperishable memory of a vanished dream as those conceptions of happiness the impression of which is cherished though they are for an age like mine no longer for at length i am a grown man whom distastes have matured and thanks to my destiny i have no other master than the modicum of reason which we receive one knows not why from above i am by no means under the yoke of the passions desire does not lead me astray pleasure is unlikely to corrupt me i have renounced all these futilities of strong souls i shall not be so absurd as to enjoy those romantic affairs on which a revulsion follows or to be the dupe of a fine sentiment i feel competent to behold with indifference a delightful prospect a lovely sky a virtuous action a pathetic scene and did i think it worth while like a man of the best taste i could cover a yawn with smiles divert myself though consumed by chagrins and expire of weariness with complete self-possession and signal dignity during the first moment i felt astonished at meeting her and now i am again astonished because i do not see where it can lead is there any reason however why it should lead anywhere how many occurrences are there in the course of the world which are either isolated or without known results i make little progress in eliminating the particular instinct which seeks an outcome and consequence for all things and for those especially which a chance brings about i am invariably anxious to find in them both the effect of a design and an instrument of some necessity there is some amusement in this curious tendency it has afforded us more than one opportunity for a laugh in common nor does it come inconveniently at the present moment had i known of this meeting it is certain that i should not have been discovered in that direction i think nevertheless that i should have been wrong a dreamer should see all and a dreamer has unfortunately nothing of importance to fear is it necessary furthermore to avoid everything which connects with the life of the soul and whatsoever makes known its losses would it indeed be possible a perfume a sound a ray of light will reveal to me in the same manner that there are other things in human nature than digestion and slumber a motion of delight in the heart of one who is unfortunate the deep breathing of another in enjoyment each alike will admonish me of that mysterious combination that infinite sequence which intelligence nourishes and unceasingly transmutes of which bodies are the materials only set up by the eternal idea as the types of some invisible thing which it casts like dice or computes like numbers again upon the banks of the sone i said to myself the eye is past understanding not only does it so to speak receive the infinite but seems even to reproduce it it beholds the entire world while that which it reflects which it pictures which it expresses is vaster still 
a grace which draws all along with it a sweet and penetrating eloquence an expression more comprehensive than are the things expressed the harmony which constitutes the universal bond all these are in the eye of a woman these and still more are in the boundless voice of her who feels in speaking she creates new forms and new perceptions she awakes the soul from its lethargy she conducts and assumes it through the whole domain of moral life when she sings it would seem that outward things become moved and plastic that she forms them and in like manner creates new perceptions natural life is no longer ordinary life all is romantic animated inebriating there seated in repose or engaged on some other affair she transports us and we are plunged with herself in the immense world our life is enlarged by this sublime and stately motion at such times how frigid appear those men who are agitated by so many trifles in what nothingness they retain us and how wearisome it is to dwell among such tumultuous yet speechless beings but when all strivings all aptitudes all triumphs and all the gifts of accident have united for the shaping of a superb countenance an unblemished body a consummate manner a noble soul a sensitive heart a capacious mind one day is sufficient for weariness and discouragement to commence the annihilation of all in the void of a cloister in the horror of a designing marriage in the nullity of a fastidious life i propose to continue seeing her she no longer expects anything we shall do well together she will not be surprised to find that i am devoured by weariness and i have no fear of adding anything to her own our situation is defined and so absolutely that i shall not modify my own by visiting her when she has quitted the country i picture already with what pleasant but jaded grace she receives the society which tries her and with what impatience she looks forward to the morrow of days devoted to pleasure daily with scarce an exception i discern for her the same round of weariness concerts and soirees all these pastimes are the toil of the so-called happy ones it devolves upon them even as the care of the vine upon the daily labourer and it is heavier upon them than upon him for their toil does not carry its consolation because it produces nothing End of section twenty seven Section twenty eight of Obermann. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Obermann by Etienne Piver de Senancourt, translated by Arthur Edward Waite, eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two. Sixth year, letter forty one lyon may eighteen six fortune strives one would say to replace those chains on man which he has cast off in spite of fortune what has it profited me to leave everything in search of a freer life if i have seen external things so far as my nature permits me it has been only in passing without enjoying them and as if to multiply within me the impatience to possess them the slave of sense i have in no wise been and i am the more unfortunate its vanity cannot deceive me but after all is not something required to fill life can existence satisfy when it is empty if the life of the heart be only a turbulent void is it not far better to relinquish it for a more tranquil nothingness intelligence as it seems to me is driven to seek for a result i wish to be informed as to that of my own life i desire something to enfold and absorb my hours i cannot endure to feel them for ever surging so heavily over me lonely and slowly without desires without illusions without end if my acquaintance with life must be limited to its miseries is it an advantage to have received it is it wisdom to continue it you will not think that incapable of coping with the ills of humanity i dare not endure their fear you know me better than that no misfortunes would tempt me to lay down life 
the soul is aroused by opposition to a prouder bearing when we have to battle with great sorrows we return into our true selves we take delight in our energy at least there is something to do but the embarrassments the weariness the constraints the insipidity of life fatigue and discourage me the ardent man can nerve himself for suffering since he has the pretension some day to enjoy but what consideration can support him who expects nothing i am weary of leading so vain a life truly i might still exercise patience but my days glide by with nothing of utility accomplished and wholly without enjoyment without hope even as without peace do you believe that given an unconquerable soul all this could be perpetuated through long years i cannot but think that there is also a reason for things in the physical order and that necessity itself has a coherent course a kind of end which can be anticipated by intelligence i inquire sometimes whither i shall be brought by this constraint which binds me to weariness this apathy from which i can never emerge this order of things so null and so tasteless from which i know not how to liberate myself where all is deficient all delays all fails where every probability melts away where effort is turned aside where each change miscarries where expectation is ever deceived even that of the misfortune which is at least formative where one would say that some hostile will endeavours to retain me in a condition of suspension and shackles to decoy me by vague prospects and evasive hopes in order to consume my entire span without having attained produced or possessed anything i review the dejecting vista of the long years which have been squandered i observe how the future always so alluring changes and falls off as it approaches smitten with a breath of death at the funereal gleam of the present it grows pallid from the very moment that we seek to enjoy it and stripping off the charms which masked it and the illusion grown stale already it passes alone forsaken dragging heavily its exhausted and ghastly sceptre as if outraged by the fatigue occasioned by the miserable burden of its ever dragging chain when i forecast this disenchanted space through which must be drawn the remnants of my youth and my life when my thoughts endeavour to forecast before the uniform descent where all flows and is lost do you find anything that i can see to its finish or aught that may hide from me the abyss in which all finds end must i not rather weary and cast down assured too fully of my incapacity go in search at least of repose and when an inevitable power weighs me down incessantly how shall i find that repose unless i myself go forth to it an end according to its nature there must be to everything since my relative existence is cut off from the course of the world why should i continue to vegetate for still an indefinite period useless to that world and a weariness to myself shall it be for the empty instinct of going on for mere breath and progress towards age to keep awake bitterly when all reposes and go in quest of darkness when the earth is blossoming to have only a longing for desires to know only the dream of existence to remain misplaced isolated in the scene of human afflictions when no one is happy through my instrumentality when i have only a bare notion of the part of a man to cling to a lost life miserable slave whom life rejects who hugs only its shadow greedy of existence as if true existence remained to him and willing to continue miserably through want of courage to cease from suffering what to me are the sophisms of a soft and flattering philosophy vain disguise of a cowardly instinct vain wisdom of patients who perpetuate the ills which they have learned to bear so well legitimizing our slavery by appealing to some fancied necessity wait they will say to me moral evil works itself out by the mere fact of its duration wait 
the times will alter and you will be satisfied in the end or if they continue the same you will yourself suffer alteration by making use of the present as it is you will have weakened that too ardent desire for a better future and having learned how to endure life it will become a boon to your more tranquil heart passion ceases loss passes out of memory misfortune retrieves itself for me i have no passions i complain neither of loss nor misfortune of nothing which can cease nothing which can be forgotten nothing which can be retrieved a new passion affords a distraction from one that has grown stale but where shall i find a nourishment for my heart when it shall have lost that thirst which consumes it it desires all it asks all it contains all what can be put in place of that infinite which my thought demands regrets are forgotten other benefits replace them but what benefits can lull universal regrets all that is proper to human nature belongs to my being it has sought nourishment conformed to its nature and it has emptied itself upon an impalpable shadow know you of any blessing which compensates for the regret of a world if my woe is in the nothingness of my life will time soothe evils which time aggravates and must i hope that they will cease when it is by the very fact of their duration that they are past bearing wait better times will perchance bring about that which appears to be denied by your present destiny men of a single day who scheme and grow old in scheming who reason about a remote future when death is at your door dreaming of consoling illusions amidst the instability of things do you never realize the rapidity of their course do you not see that your life falls asleep in the act of balancing itself and that this vicissitude which sustains your deceived heart agitates only to extinguish it in a last shock close at hand were the life of man perpetual were it even longer than it is if it were uniform to its final hour then hope might seduce me and i should perchance await that which might at least be possible but is there any permanence in life can the day to come minister to the needs of the day that is here and that which is requisite now will it be good to-morrow our heart suffers changes more rapidly than the year with its seasons their vicissitudes are at least subject to a certain constancy since they recur in the succession of the ages but our days which know not any renewal have no two hours alike their seasons which are never restored have each its own needs if one have lost that which belongs to it it has lost it past all retrieving and no other age can possess that which has not been attained by our prime it is the prerogative of the madman to pretend to strive against necessity the wise man accepts things as they are offered by destiny he endeavours only to consider them in those relations which can render them fortunate for him without disturbing himself to no purpose as to the way in which he travels on this globe he has learned how to ensure at each tarrying place which marks his course at once the advantages of the expedient and the security of repose and seeing that he must soon attain the term of his journey he goes forth forward without effort goes astray even without anxiety what would it profit him to wish for more to set himself against the force of the world or seek to avoid shackles and inevitable ruin no individual can arrest the universal course and nothing is vainer than to cry out against evils which inhere necessarily in our nature but if all be of necessity what do you pretend to offer in opposition to all my weariness why blame it can i feel differently if on the contrary our particular destiny is in our hands if man can choose and will there must yet remain for him those obstacles which he cannot overcome those miseries which he cannot avert from his life but all human effort can do no more against him than destroy him he alone can be made subject to all who is resolved absolutely to live but he who pretends to nothing can be made subject to nothing you require that i should be resigned to unavoidable evils i could also wish it but when i consent to relinquish everything inevitable evils exist for me no longer 
the many blessings which remain to man even in the midst of misfortune cannot detain me blessings are more numerous than evils that is true in the absolute sense and still it is a strange self-deception to reason in this manner a single evil which we cannot efface destroys the effect of twenty blessings which we appear to enjoy and in spite of the assurances of reason there are many evils the assuagement of which requires time and toil except indeed for the sectarian with a taint of fanaticism time it is true dissipates these evils and the resistance of the wise man exhausts them still more quickly but they have been so multiplied by the sedulous imagination of other men that new evils will always be substituted before their term and seeing that blessings pass away equally with sufferings if man has ten pleasures for every pain but if one single pain corrupts a hundred pleasures during all his span life will at least be indifferent and useless to him who has parted with all his illusions the ill remains the good ceases by what allurement to what end should i go on enduring life the upshot is known what remains to be done the truly irreparable loss is that of the desires i know that a natural proclivity binds man to life but it is in some sense an instinct of habit and in no wise proves that life is good the living being by the fact of its existence must cling to existence reason alone can make it gaze without terror upon the void it is remarkable that man whose reason so much affects to despise instinct authorizes the most blind of all to justify the sophisms of reason it will be objected that habitual impatience connects with the impetuosity of the passions and that the aged cling to life in proportion as they are calmed and illuminated by the years i will not pause to ask whether the reason which is in course of extinction is worth more than that faculty in its prime whether each epoch has not its appropriate way of feeling which would be out of place at any other epoch if in fine our unproductive institutions our grey-beard virtues the achievement of caducity at least in their principle prove substantially in favour of frigid old age i should answer only every alloyed thing is regretted at the moment of its loss an irretrievable loss is never regarded apathetically after lengthy possession our imagination which in life we find relinquishes a blessing immediately on its acquisition so as to fix our endeavours on that which remains to be gained lingers when things come to an end only over the good which is removed from us and not over the evil from which we are liberated it is not thus that the value of practical life should be estimated for the majority of men but ask of them each day of that existence for which they hope unceasingly whether the present moment contents them is void of satisfaction or is to them indifferent your results will then be certain all other reckoning is merely a mode of self-deception and i seek to set a clear and simple truth in place of confused notions and disproved sophistries i shall be told seriously curb your desires limit these over urgent needs place your affections in things near at hand why seek that which is made remote by circumstances why insist on that with which men dispense so easily why wish for useful things there are so many who do not give them a thought why bemoan public misfortunes do you find that they disturb the sleep of any one who is happy what profit these reasonings of a strong mind this instinct of things sublime is it impossible for you to dream of perfection without assuming to lead in its direction a crowd which laughs at it even amidst its moaning and in order to enjoy your life do you need a grand or simple existence powerful circumstances chosen places men and things after your own heart all is good for man provided that he exists and wherever it is possible for him to live there he can live contented possessed of fair repute some acquaintances who wish him well a house and the wherewithal to take his stand in the world what more does he require assuredly i have nothing to reply to these counsels from the mouth of a mature man and i hold that as a fact they are excellent for those who find them such notwithstanding i am calmer now and begin to weary even of my impatience sombre yet tranquil ideas become more familiar to me i recur willingly to those who in the morning of their life have found their eternal night this thought offers me repose and consolation it is the instinct of the sunset but why this need of the darkness why is the light irksome to me they will know some day when change shall have come for them when i shall be no more 
when you will be no more do you contemplate a crime if weary of the evils of life and disabused above all as to its benefits suspended already over the abyss marked out for the supreme moment but restrained by the friend accused by the moralist condemned by my country held guilty in the eyes of the social man i had perforce to make answer to his reproaches here is what it seems to me i might urge i have investigated and ascertained all if i have not actually experienced i have at least foreseen all your sorrows have blighted my soul they are intolerable because they are purposeless your pleasures are illusory evanescent a single day suffices to taste and relinquish them i have sought happiness within myself but apart from fanaticism i have seen that it was not made for mere man i have spoken of it to those who surround me but they had no leisure to consider it i have asked the multitude branded by misery and the privileged classes oppressed by weariness they have told me we suffer to-day but we shall enjoy to-morrow for myself i know that the day which approaches follows in the same track as the day which flies live you whom a felicitous illusion can yet deceive but i outwearied with that which misdirects hope without initiative and almost without desire life is no longer for me i judge of life like the man going down into the tomb let it therefore open for me how should i retard the end when this is already attained nature offers illusions for our faith and our love it lifts the veil only at the moment marked out for death it has not raised it for you and so live on it has raised it for me life is mine no more it may well be that man's true good is his moral independence and that his miseries are only the consciousness of his own weakness in so many situations that all without him is as dream and that peace is in the heart inaccessible to illusions but on what shall disillusioned thought repose what can be performed in life when all that it contains has become indifferent when the passion of all things when the universal need of strong souls has consumed our hearts the charm forsakes our undeceived desires and irremediable weariness is born of the cold ashes funereal ominous it absorbs all hope reigns over ruins devours extinguishes by an invincible effort it hollows our grave the asylum which shall at least ensure rest by forgetfulness and calm in nothingness in the absence of desires what is to be done with life to go on vegetating stupidly to drag oneself along the inanimate track of cares and of business to grovel impotently in the degradation of the slave or the nullity of the crowd to think but without serving the universal order to feel without being alive thus unfortunate plaything of an unexplained destiny man will abandon his life to the chances of things and seasons thus deceived by the opposition of his inclinations his reason his laws his nature he hurries with elastic step and full of daring towards the sepulchral night the eye flashing yet restless in the midst of phantoms the heart charged with sorrows he seeks and goes astray he vegetates and sleeps harmony of the world sublime dream moral end social gratitude laws duties words sacred among men i cannot brave you save in the opinion of the misguided crowd in truth i abandon some friends whom i shall afflict my country to which i have so imperfectly returned its benefits all those men whom i should serve here are occasions of regret but not of remorse who more than myself can realize the value of union the authority of duties the joy of service i hoped to perform some good it was the most flattering the most unreasoning of my dreams in the permanent uncertainty of an existence for ever in disturbance for ever precarious enslaved you all blind and docile follow the beaten track of the established order thus abandoning your life to your habits and losing it without difficulty just as you would lose a day carried away by this universal aberration i might also also leave some benefits in these paths of error but all such good to all so easy will be performed by good men without me for such there are may they flourish and useful in some way may they find themselves happy as for me in this abyss of evils i shall be in no sense consoled i confess if i do no more a single unfortunate near me will be assuaged possibly one hundred thousand will continue to sigh and i impotent in the midst of them shall find ever attributed to the nature of things the bitter fruits of human deviation and as the veritable work of necessity the perpetuation of those miseries wherein i think that i discern the accidental caprice of a perfectibility which is trying its hand let me be condemned severely 
if i refuse the sacrifice of a happy life to the general welfare but when fated to be useless i invoke a repose too long already awaited i repeat that i may confess my regrets but not my remorse under the burden of an evanescent misfortune having regard to the variability of impressions and events doubtless i ought to expect more auspicious days but the evil which weighs down my years is not an evanescent evil who shall fill this void through which they flow so tardily who shall restore desires to my life and confidence to my will the good itself i find useless would that men henceforth might have only evils to deplore during hours of tempest hope sustains and gives strength against the danger because that ends but if the time of calm wearies you for what then will you hope if there can be any good in the morrow i will await it gladly but if such be my destiny that to-morrow incapable of amelioration may possibly be still more baneful i will not behold the calamity of that day supposing it to be really my duty to live out the life which has been given me doubtless i should gather strength against its miseries swift time will bear them speedily away howsoever burdened our days they remain bearable because they are limited death and life are in my power i do not cling to the one and in no sense do i covet the other but let reason decide whether i have the right to choose between them it is a crime i am told to forsake life but those same sophists who forbid me death expose or hurry me thereto their innovations multiply it about me their precepts lead me up to it or their laws prescribe it for me it is a glory to renounce life when it is good a justice to slay him who would keep alive and that death which should be sought when it is dreaded it would be crime to embrace when it is desired you make sport of my existence under a hundred specious or ridiculous pretexts i alone have no rights over myself when i love life i must disdain it when i am happy you send me forth to die but if i wish for death it is then that you forbid me that refuge you impose life upon me when i abhor it if i cannot take away my life i cannot also expose myself to a probable death is this the prudence which you exact from your subjects on the field of battle they must calculate the chances before marching up to the enemy and all your heroes are criminals they are not justified by the order which you give to them for you have no right to send them forth to their death if they on their part had no right of consent to go there an identical madness authorizes your extravagances and dictates your precepts and so much in consequence is to justify so much injustice if i have no such right of death over myself who has given it to society have i ceded what i do not possess what social principle do you devise by which it can be explained to me how a body acquires an internal and reciprocal power which is not possessed by its members and how i have delegated for my own oppression a prerogative which was not mine even for escape from oppression will it be affirmed that if a man in isolation does have this natural privilege he alienates it by becoming a member of society but such right is inalienable by its nature and no one can enter into a compact which deprives him of all power of withdrawal when it is used to his prejudice by others before me it has been demonstrated that man has no title to renounce his freedom or in other words to cease from being man how then should he waive the most essential most sure most irresistible right of that freedom the one alone which guarantees his independence and remains always with him against misfortune how long will absurdity so palpable continue to enslave men if it could be a crime to relinquish life it is you that i should accuse you whose baleful innovations have led me to wish for death which independently of you i should have staved off that death the universal loss which nothing repairs even that mournful and last refuge which you dare to forbid me as if you had some hold over my final hour as if there also the forms of your legislation could restrict rights lying outside the world which it governs oppress my life law is frequently also the strongest right but death is the limit which i seek to oppose to your power elsewhere you may command as to this you must show your proof tell me clearly without your habitual circumlocution without that vain eloquence of words which cannot deceive me without those great misinterpreted names of force virtue eternal order moral destiny tell me simply whether the laws of society are made for the actual and visible world or for a future existence which is remote if they are made for the actual world tell me how the laws which are relative to a given order of things can impose an obligation when such order exists no longer how that which governs life can obtain beyond it how that fashion in conformity with which we have determined our relations can subsist when those relations have ended 
and how it is possible that i could ever have consented that our convention should bind me when i no longer wished it what is the foundation let me say rather the pretext of your laws have they not promised the happiness of all when i wish for death to all appearance i do not find myself happy should the contract which burdens me be irrevocable an onerous engagement as to particular concerns of life might find at least its compensations and sacrifice can be made of an advantage when the power of possessing others remains to us but can total abnegation enter into the conception of a man who preserves any notion of right and truth every society is based on a combination of powers an exchange of services but when i do harm to society does not refuse to protect me if therefore it does nothing for me or does indeed much against me i also have the right to refuse it my service our compact no longer suits it therefore it breaks it our compact suits me no longer i break it also i do not rebel i go forth it is a final effort of your jealous tyranny too many victims escape you too many evidences of public misery rise up against the vain noise of your promises and display your astute codes in their barren nakedness and their bankrupt ineptitude i was too simple when i spoke to you of justice i noticed the pitying smile in your parental glance it assured me that force and interest lead men you have so ordered it well then how shall your law be maintained who shall avenge its infraction shall it affect him who is no more shall it visit a pitiable effort on those who belong to him o oh, useless madness multiply our miseries that is necessary for the great things which you plan necessary for the quality of glory which you seek enslave torment but have at least an end be iniquitous and coldly atrocious but at least be not these in vain what a mockery is that law of servitude which is neither obeyed nor vindicated where your power ends your impositions begin so essential is it to your empire that you should never cease to make sport of man it is nature it is supreme intelligence which will me to bow my head under this insolent and grinding yoke will that i should hug my chain and drag it with docility till the moment comes when you are pleased to break it over my head whatsoever you do a god has put my life in your hands and the order of the world would be inverted did your slave escape the eternal you tell me has conferred an existence upon me and has imposed my part also in the harmony of his works i ought to fulfil it to the end i have no right to emancipate myself from his empire you forget too quickly that soul with which you have endowed me this earthly body is but dust do you not remember but my intelligence breath imperishable emanated from the universal intelligence can never be emancipated from his law how should i quit the empire of the master of all things i change place only places are nothing for him who contains and governs all things he has not set me more exclusively on earth than in the country where he willed me to be born nature watches over my preservation i should also preserve myself to obey her laws and since she has imparted to me the fear of death she forbids me to seek it that is a fine phrase but nature preserves or immolates me at will or at least in this respect the course of things has no ascertained law i desire to live and a gulf opens to swallow me the bolt descends to blast me if nature takes away my life when i love it i take it myself when i have ceased to love it any longer if it snatches some blessing away from me i reject some evil if it devotes my existence to the arbitrary course of events i quit or keep it as i choose since it has given me the faculty of willing and of choosing i make use of it in a case where i have to decide between the greatest of interests nor do i understand that the use of the liberty received from her to make choice of that which she inspires is to offer outrage thereto being myself the work of nature i interrogate her laws and there i find my freedom placed in the social order i make answer to the false precepts of moralists and i reject the laws which no legislator has the right to enact as to all which is not interdicted by a superior and evident law my law is my desire because it is the sign of a natural impulse it is my right by the mere fact that it is my desire life is no boon for me if disillusioned as to its blessings i have only its evils it is then my bail i set it aside it is the right of that being who chooses and wills if i make bold to judge where most hesitate it is by deep conviction my decision may conform to my needs but is prompted by no partiality i may be mistaken but will affirm that i am not guilty not seeing how i could well be so my design was to ascertain what was open to me i do not say what i shall do i have neither despair nor passion enough for my security to be assured that the useless burden can be cast off when it weighs me down too much long since has life fatigued me from day to day it increases my weariness 
yet i am not in any sense exasperated i also discover some antipathy to the utter loss of my being were it necessary to choose at once whether i should burst all bonds or remain in them irrevocably for forty years i should not i think hesitate long but i am the less in haste because in a few months my possibilities will be the same and the alps alone are suited to the mode in which i should wish to find extinction end of section twenty eight section twenty nine of obermann this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org obermann by etienne piver de senancourt translated by arthur edward waite eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two the sixth year letters forty two and forty three letter forty two lyon may twenty nine six from beginning to end i have read and re-read your letter several times it is the outcome of too keen an interest i respect the friendly feeling which misleads you and i will admit that i was not altogether so alone as i tried to make out you exhibit most laudable motives in an ingenious manner but believe me that though much may be urged to the impassioned man who is impelled by despair there is not one word of weight forthcoming in reply to the tranquil man who reasons on his death it is not that i have come to any decision weariness overwhelms me loathing crushes me i know that all this evil is within me why cannot i rest content with eating and sleeping for in the end i eat and i sleep nor is the life which i drag on exceedingly miserable taken separately my days are bearable but their sum overwhelms me activity in accordance with his nature is necessary to the organized being will it satisfy him that he is properly sheltered is warmly and softly bedded is nourished on choice fruits stayed about by the voice of waters and the fragrance of flowers ah but ye hold him captive this softness enervates him these essences importune him these chosen aliments do not nourish him take back your gifts and your chains let him act let him suffer even let him act for this is to enjoy and to live apathy notwithstanding has become my second nature the very notion of an active life would seem to terrify or astonish me things that are circumscribed repel me and yet their habit cleaves to me things that are sublime allure me but my indolence dreads them i know not that which i am that which i love or desire i bemoan myself with no cause desire having no object and discern nothing except that i am out of my true place this prerogative which man cannot forfeit this privilege of ceasing to be i reflect upon it not as the object of an invariable longing nor as that of an irrepealable resolve but as the consolation which remains amidst prolonged tribulations as the limit within reach always of disgust and importunity you remind me of the concluding sentence in one of lord edward's letters i find no evidence against me therein as to the principle itself i am of the same way of thinking but the law admitting no exception which forbids us to lay down life voluntarily would not appear to follow from it the morality of man and his enthusiasm the restlessness of his aims his inherent need of expansion seem to proclaim that his end is not in fleeting things that his activity is not confined to the shadows which we see that his thought has necessary and eternal concepts for its objects that his call is to labour for the amelioration or reparation of the world that his destiny is in some sort to elaborate to rarify to organize to impart more energy to matter more power to existences more perfection to organs more fecundity to germs more directness to the analogies of things more empire to order 
some consider him to be the agent of nature employed by her to complete and polish her work to set in operation so much of brute matter as is accessible to him to subject formless composites to the laws of harmony to purify metals to improve plants to decompose or combine elements to change gross into refined substances and inert into active matter to draw less advanced beings nearer to himself and to raise and advance himself towards the universal principle of fire light order and harmony on this hypothesis man who is held worthy of so magnificent a ministry conqueror of obstacles and loathing should assuredly remain at his post to the last moment i respect such constancy but that it is his post is not demonstrated to my mind if man survives apparent death why i repeat it is his exclusive station rather on earth than in the state or place of his origin if on the other hand death is the unquestionable term of his existence with what can he be charged unless indeed it is with some social amelioration he has his duties but necessarily limited to the present life they can neither bind him beyond nor make it binding that he should remain in bond in the social order he will be expected to maintain the order amidst men he must serve men indubitably the virtuous person will not forego life so long as he can be serviceable therein for him service and happiness are synonymous if he suffers but at the same time is effecting substantial good he is rather satisfied than the reverse but when the evil which he undergoes is greater than the good which he performs it must be open to him to relinquish all he ought indeed to do so when he is at once useless and unfortunate could he be assured that in both respects there will be no improvement in his lot life has been conferred on him apart from consent of his if still forced to conserve it what liberty would remain to him he can alienate his other rights but this is imprescriptible deprived of such a last refuge his dependence is frightful to suffer much in order to be a little useful is a virtue which can be inculcated in life but not a duty which can be imposed on those who withdraw from it so long as you use things it is an obligatory virtue it is on such conditions that you possess the freedom of the city but when you renounce the contract that contract ceases to bind you what further is to be understood by being useful when it is said that each one of us can be so the shoemaker who is good at his work saves inconvenience to his customers yet i doubt whether such a man if peculiarly unfortunate is in conscience obliged to go on till he is struck down by paralysis simply to multiply satisfactory measurements of the foot when this is the quality of our usefulness we may well be permitted to cease from exercising it a man frequently evokes admiration by the way he supports life but this is not to say that he shall always be compelled to endure it here as it seems to me are many words about a very simple matter yet simple as i find it do not deem that i am stubborn over the question or ascribe more importance to the voluntary act which puts a period to life than to any other deed of that life i do not see that to die can be so great a matter so many men perish with no time to think about it or even to know it a voluntary death must be deliberate no doubt but this is true of all actions which are not limited in their consequences to the present moment when a situation becomes probable observe also what it may exact from us it is well to have thought of it beforehand in order not to be compelled in the alternative to act without having deliberated or to lose in deliberations the opportunity of action a man who with no prescribed principles for his guidance finds himself alone with a woman does not begin reasoning about his duties he begins by failing as regards his most sacred engagements he may think about them possibly later on in like manner how many heroic actions would have missed accomplishment had it been needful before risking life to spend an hour in their discussion 
once more remember that i have made no resolve but i like to bear in mind that a resource infallible in its nature and the remembrance of which may often abate my impatience is not interdicted me letter forty three lyons may thirty six la bruyere has remarked i should not think it a hateful situation if my full trust committed me to a reasonable person to be governed by him in all things both absolutely and for ever i should be assured of doing well without the anxiety of deliberation i should enjoy the tranquillity of him who is ruled by reason for myself i assure you that i would become a slave with a view to independence but i say this to you only i know not whether you will term this a drollery a man entrusted with a certain part in the world who can shape things to his will has undoubtedly more freedom than a slave or there is more satisfaction at least in his life since he can follow it after his own manner but there are others who are trampled on all sides if they attempt a single movement the inextricable chain which enfolds them draws them back into nullity it is a spring which reacts in proportion to the power with which it is pulled what can you expect of the victim who is thus embarrassed despite his apparent liberty he can produce outside the acts of his life no more than a man whose life is wasted in a dungeon those who have chanced upon a weak corner of their cage where fate has forgotten to rivet the bolts taking credit for this fortunate accident come forward and cry to you courage enterprise is needed boldness wanted do like us they fail to perceive that it is scarcely they who have acted i do not mean that chance brings about human affairs but i think that these are overruled at least in part by a power alien to man and that a concurrence independent of our will is essential to success were there no moral force which modifies what we term the probabilities of chance the course of the world would be in a much greater state of uncertainty a calculation would change more frequently the fortunes of a people every destiny would be subject to some obscure computation the world would be the opposite of what it is there would be an end to laws because they would be devoid of consequence who does not recognize that all this is impossible it would involve a contradiction good men would be free to fulfil their projects if there be no general force which impels all things what strange fascination prevents men from perceiving that in order to have roman candles elastic cravats and baptismal comfits they have so disposed everything that one fault or one occurrence can brand and corrupt a man's entire existence because a woman has forgotten the future for a few moments nothing in that future remains to her but nine months of bitter solicitude and a life of scorn the odious scatterbrain who has just killed his victim to-morrow parts with his health for ever by forgetting in his turn and you do not see that such a condition of things where a single incident wrecks a moral life or a single caprice annihilates a thousand men all that which you term the social edifice is but a congeries of masked miseries and illusory errors and that you are comparable to those children who believe that their playthings are precious because they are covered with gold paper you remark tranquilly such is the way of the world there is no question and is it not proof positive that we are nothing else in the universe than antique figures which a juggler dances marshals one against another and bandies about in all manners compels them to laugh to fight to weep to skip and all to amuse whom in truth i know not but that is why i could wish to be a slave my will would then be in subjection but my thought free on the other hand in this my pretended independence i must act in accordance with my thought i am unable to do so all the same nor do i clearly understand the hindrance it follows that my whole nature is in bondage without having the will to suffer i do not altogether know what i want happy is he who seeks only to stick to his business he can set his object before him 
i am deeply conscious that no great thing not one of all the things which are possible to man and are conceived as sublime in his thought is beyond the reach of my nature and yet i feel equally that my end is missing my life squandered and made barren already it is smitten with death its emotion is no less vain than immoderate powerful it is yet unproductive idle and eager amidst the tranquil and eternal industry of all that lives i do not know what to will and hence i must will all things for in fine i can find no repose when i am consumed with desires i can pause at nothing in the void i long to be happy but what man has the right to exact happiness on an earth where well-nigh all things are exhausted in the sole attempt to lessen their miseries if the peace of felicity be denied me i must have the activity of a strong life truly i have no desire to range from grade to grade to assume a place in society to have superiors who are confessedly such so that i may in turn have inferiors to despise there is nothing so burlesque as this hierarchy of scorn descending in proportions so exactly shaded and including the whole state from the prince under the obedience of god above according to his claim to the poorest shoeblack in the suburb under the obedience of the female who nightly lodges him on squalid straw the steward scarcely presumes to walk in the master's chamber but no sooner is he back in his kitchen than he is lord of all the scullion who trembles at his glance you might consider to be the last of mankind by no means he orders sternly the poor woman who removes the refuse and obtains a few pence by his patronage the valet who has charge of messages is a confidential person and gives commissions of his own to the under valet who by reason of a less presentable figure is relegated to coarser work while the mendicant who knows his business crushes with all his skill the fellow-beggar who is not blessed with an ulcer he only has lived fully whose whole life has been passed in that position which is proper to his character or he whose genius embraces many objects who is taken by his destiny into all possible situations and in each is acquainted with what the situation calls for in the hour of danger he is morgan as a people's leader he is lycurgus among savages he is odosi with the greeks alcibiades in the credulous east he is zarathustra he lives in retreat like philocles he rules like trajan in a savage land he inures himself for times to come he vanquishes the crocodiles swims rivers hunts the wild goat among the frozen rocks lights his pipe with the lava of a volcano destroys the polar bear in the vicinity of his retreat piercing him with the shafts which his own hand has made but man has so brief a span for life and the duration of that which he leaves behind him is so full of uncertainties were his heart less eager perhaps his reason would counsel him to live merely without sufferings diffusing some happiness about him among a few friends worthy to enjoy it without disfiguring his work it is said that wise men by living independently of the passions live without impatience and as they regard all things with the same eye they find in their quietude the peace and the dignity of being but great obstacles are frequently set up against this tranquil indifference to accept the present as it offers and to despise the hope as well as the fears of the future there is only one method at once sure easy and simple and that is to dismiss from one's notions that future the thought of which is always anxious because it is always dubious to be free from fears and desires all must be abandoned to the event as if to a species of necessity for enjoyment or for suffering as it comes and to make use no less peaceably of the actual moment if the hour which follows it should bring death in its train a steadfast soul habituated to high considerations may attain the indifference of the wise as to all which restless or predisposed persons term misfortunes or blessings but when it is necessary to ponder over this future how can one be other than anxious if it be indispensable to arrange everything 
to project to guide how can solicitude be avoided accidents hindrances success itself must be foreseen but to foresee is to fear or to hope concerning them to act means to will and to will is to be dependent the great evil is to be compelled to act freely the slave has far more opportunity for being truly untrammelled his duties are personal only he is led by nature's law the law which is natural to man and is therefore simple he is indeed subject to his master but the rule as to this is clear epictetus was happier than marcus aurelius the slave is exempt from anxieties which are reserved for those who are free the slave is not incessantly compelled to harmonize himself with the course of outward things a harmony which is always uncertain and disquieting the unceasing difficulty of all human life which seeks to rationalize that life it is assuredly a necessity to think of the future to be concerned with it and to set our affections therein when we are responsible for the destiny of others indifference in such a case is no longer permissible and where is the man even if apparently isolated who cannot do good to something and is consequently dispensed from the search after the means of doing so where is he whose neglect will never involve other evils than his own the sage of epicurus must have neither wife nor child and even this is insufficient whenever the interests of another are dependent on our prudence small cares and anxieties must alloy our peace disturb our soul and even frequently extinguish our genius what will befall him who is shackled by such obstacles and is so constituted as to distress himself about them he will struggle hardly between those cares to which he is sacrificed despite himself and the disdain which makes him alien to them he will be neither superior to events because this he should not be nor fitted to make good use thereof he will be variable in wisdom and impatient or awkward in his business he will do nothing well because he can perform nothing in consonance with his nature he must be neither father nor husband if he wished to live independently and he should perhaps not even have friends but to be thus alone is to live very mournfully and to live uselessly as well a man who rules the public destiny who conceives and achieves great things cannot cleave to one individual in particular nations are his friends and as a benefactor of mankind he can dispense with being that of any one man but in an obscure life it seems to me that we must at least look for some being towards whom we have duties to execute this philosophical independence is a convenient but a cold life and any one who is not an enthusiast must find it vapid at the close it is terrible to end one's days by saying no heart has been made happy by my instrumentality no felicity of man has been of my work i have lived impassable and null like the glacier which in mountain caverns has withstood the noonday heat but has never melted into the valley and ministered by its water to the pasture withered by scorching beams religion which clears up so many doubtful points puts a period to all these anxieties it provides an end which because it is never attained is never exposed it places us in subjection so as to place us in peace with ourselves the hope of the good things which it holds out abides always with us because we cannot bring it to the test it averts the idea of nothingness it averts the passions of life it disembarrasses us of our hopeless evils and our fleeting blessings substituting a dream the hope whereof superior as it may be to all real blessings endures at least until death if it proclaimed no tremendous chastisements it would appear equally beneficent and solemn but it precipitates the thought of man towards new abysses it is based on dogmas which are too many incredible while desiring its effects they cannot have experience thereof while regretting its security they cannot be in enjoyment thereof they are in search of celestial appearances but see only a mortal dream they are attracted by the recompense due to the good man but they do not find that they have deserved it from nature they would perpetuate their identity and they see that all slips away 
whilst the monastic novice who has scarcely received the tonsure distinctly hears the angel who celebrates his fasts and his praises those who have the consciousness of virtue are well aware that they will never attain this height overwhelmed by their weakness and by the emptiness of their destinies they have no other anticipation than to desire to struggle to pass like the shadow which has known nothing end of section twenty nine section thirty of obermann this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org obermann by a t m piver de senancourt translated by arthur edward waite eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two the sixth year letter forty four Lyon, june fifteen six i have read more than once and pondered over your objections or if you prefer it your reproaches we have a grave question in hand and i am about to attempt a reply if the hours which are spent in discussion are commonly wasted this is not the case with those which are devoted to writing do you seriously consider that this opinion which you say adds to my misfortune is one for which i am responsible i make no question that to believe is the safer course you also remind me of the assertion that such belief is necessary to the sanction of morality let me observe first of all that i make no pretence to decide and should even prefer to refrain from denial but that i find it precipitate to say the least to affirm the disposition to regard as impossible that which we could wish to be true is no doubt a misfortune but how that misfortune is to be escaped when it has already overtaken us i confess that i do not know death as you assure me does not exist for man you regard the hic iacet as impious not there under the cold marble and among the extinct ashes is the man of virtue or the man of genius who has affirmed it in this sense the hic iacet would be false on the tomb of a dog his faithful and assiduous instinct are assuredly not there but where then it is no more you ask me what has become of the vitality the spirit the soul of this body which has just passed into dissolution the answer is very simple when the fire on your hearth is put out the light the heat the movement in fine leave it as all know and pass into another world there to be rewarded eternally if it has warmed your feet or eternally punished if it has scorched your slippers so also the melody of the lyre which has been broken by the ephor will pass on in broken murmurs until it has expiated by more austere sounds those voluptuous modulations by which it once corrupted morals you urge that nothing can be destroyed which is true of an object of a corpuscle but not of form of relation of faculty i would indeed that the soul of a good and unfortunate man survived him for an immortal felicity but if the conception of such heavenly felicity has something of heaven itself that does not prove it to be anything better than a dream doubtless the dogma is at once beautiful and consoling but the beauty and the consolation which i observe in it does not even furnish me with the hope to believe therein when a sophist takes upon himself to inform me that if i am under the obedience of his doctrine for the space of ten days i shall receive at the end of that time the gift of supernatural faculties shall be invulnerable young for ever in the enjoyment of all that is required for happiness powerful for good and devoid as it were of the wish to do evil such a dream may no doubt dazzle my imagination and i may possibly regret its alluring promises but i shall be unable to perceive that it is true 
in vain will he object that i take no risk in believing it did he promise me still more if i could be persuaded that the sun shines at midnight that would exceed my power if in the end he confessed to me in truth i told you a falsehood and i deceive other people after the same fashion but do not divulge it for my object is to console them might i not reply to him that on this coarse and sodden earth where gay or in desolation some hundreds of millions of immortals debate and suffer in the midst of the same incertitude no one has demonstrated yet that it is a duty to tell them something which is regarded as consoling and to conceal from them that which is true full of disquiet and less or more unhappy we await constantly the next hour the day which follows the year to come at the end of all we must needs have a life thereafter so far we have existed without living hence we shall live some day an inference more pleasing than accurate if it is a consolation for the unfortunate that in itself is an additional reason that i should question its truth a dream is sufficiently beautiful if it lasts till we fall asleep for ever preserve that hope he is happy who cherishes it yet confess that the reason which renders it so universal is not difficult to find it is true that we stand to lose nothing by believing it when such a course is possible but it is also no less true that pascal was guilty of a puerility when he said believe because in believing you risk nothing but much on the contrary in not believing this reasoning is decisive if it is a question of conduct but it is absurd when it is faith that is asked of us when has faith ever depended on the will the man of virtue can do no other than desire immortality and they have dared to say after that it is only the wicked who disbelieve this foolhardy judgment classes numbers of the wisest and greatest men among those who have an eternal justice to fear the intolerance of such teaching would be atrocious if it were not so imbecile by another era it is argued that every man who thinks that all ends with his death is the enemy of society necessarily an egoist and controlled only by prudence in his wickedness the variations of the human heart were better understood by helvetius when he said there are men so ill starred in their birth that they could find no happiness but in courses which lead to the gallows there are men also who cannot be virtuous save amidst contented men who participate in all which enjoys and all which suffers and would be dissatisfied if they were not contributing to the right order of things and the felicity of others these strive to do well without giving much heed to the pool of brimstone it will be objected that in any case the common run of mankind is not thus constituted that each individual among them seeks only his personal advancement and will be wicked unless he is astutely taken in this may be true up to a certain point if men could and never should be undeceived it would only remain to decide whether public interest confers the prerogative of lying and whether it is a crime or at least an evil to give utterance to the opposing truth but if this error useful or passing as such can have its season only and if it be unavoidable that one day faith on the word of another will come to an end must it not then be admitted that all your moral edifice is without foundation when once this gorgeous scaffolding has collapsed by the adoption of methods which more easily and shortly assure the present you expose the future to a subversion which will perhaps be without remedy had you on the other hand been capable of discovering in the human heart the natural groundwork of its morality had you known how to infuse therein what may have been wanting in the social mode in the customs of the city your labour greater it is true in its difficulty and calling for higher skill would have been lasting as the world 
if therefore it happened that unconvinced of that which many of the most venerated among you have not themselves believed you were told the nations are beginning to desire things certain and to distinguish things positive ethics are in course of modification faith exists no longer independently of a future life we must set about demonstrating to men that justice is necessary to their hearts that as regards the individual himself there is no happiness apart from reason and that the virtues are laws of nature no less needful to man in society than those which govern the demands of the senses if i say to you some among those just men who are the friends of order by their nature whose first necessity is to direct mankind to further union harmony and enjoyments if leaving in doubt that which has never been proved they recalled those principles of justice and universal love which cannot be put in question and took upon themselves to speak of the unchangeable ways of happiness if transported by the truth which they feel which they see which you yourselves recognize they consecrated their life to make it known after divers manners and to enforce it reasonably forgive it you who are ministers of a certain phase of truth forgive those methods which are not actually yours consider i beseech you that stoning has passed out of fashion that modern miracles have fallen into not a little derision that times are changed and that it is necessary for you to change with them i leave here the interpreters of heaven whose great character renders them signally serviceable or baneful wholly good or of unmixed wickedness venerable on the one or contemptible on the other hand i return to your letter i do not deal with all its points which would make my own too long but i could not set aside what is in effect a specious objection without remarking that it is not as well founded as it might appear to be at first sight nature is governed by unknown forces and in accordance with mysterious laws order is its measure intelligence is its motive force it may be advanced that there is no such great distance between these proven findings which are yet obscure and your own unexplainable dogmas perhaps it is further than is thought many extraordinary persons have believed in forebodings and dreams in the secret workings of unseen forces many extraordinary persons have been therefore addicted to superstitions this i admit on the understanding that they were not so addicted after the manner of small minds the historian of alexander says that he was superstitious so was frere labre but they were not superstitious after the same way there was not a little difference in their inward reasonings on another occasion we must i think refer to this point as regards the almost supernatural efforts which are actuated by religion they are not a proof to my mind of a divine origin every species of fanaticism has produced results which afford matter for astonishment to the sober-minded when your pious people have an income of thirty thousand francs they are praised very much for their charity if they give a few pence to the poor when paradise is open to them it is maintained loudly that in the absence of grace from on high they would never have had strength to accept an eternal happiness speaking generally i fail altogether to recognize that there would be anything surprising in their virtues if i were myself in their place the reward is sufficiently large and for themselves they are frequently very small to remain in the straight and narrow way they must everlastingly see hell upon their left purgatory on their right and heaven in front of them i will not say that there are never any exceptions it is enough for my purpose that they are rare if great things have been achieved by religion religion has had vast opportunities those which have been performed naturally by simple goodness are possibly less brilliant less persistent and less extolled but they are more certain and more useful stoicism had also its heroes and it found them quite apart from eternal promises or infinite threats 
had any form of worship attained so much with so little a magnificent demonstration of its divine institution would have been assuredly deduced till to-morrow farewell there are two points for inquiry whether religion does not count as one of the weakest instruments in respect of the class which receives what is termed education and whether it is not absurd that education should be given only to the tenth part of mankind when it is stated that the stoic could boast only of false virtue because he did not pretend to eternal life the insolence of zeal has been carried to an extraordinary height a not less curious example of the absurdity to which the mania of dogmatizing may lead even an excellent mind is the famous maxim of tillotson the real reason why a man is an atheist is because he is wicked i agree that the civil laws are insufficient for that unformed multitude about whom no one troubles whom we bring into existence and abandon to evil propensities and vicious habits but this proves only that there is nothing except misery and confusion under the seeming quietude of the great political states that politics in the true acceptation of the term do not exist on the earth where diplomacy or administrative finance constitute countries that are flourishing in poems and gain victories for the purposes of the gazettes i have no intention of discussing a complex question let history decide but is it not deserving of note that the terrors of the future have restrained few persons who were disposed to restraint by no other considerations as for the rest of men checks more natural more direct and hence more powerful operate on them man being endowed with the consciousness of order which is therefore inherent in his nature he is forced to make the need of it sensible to all individuals the criminals would have been fewer than those which have been left in spite of your dogmas and you would have had at least all those which they make it is said that first transgressions fill the heart immediately with the torture of remorse and leave behind them that trouble for ever they say also that an atheist to be consistent must steal from his friend and assassinate his enemy these are specimens of the contradictions which i find in the apologies of the defenders of the faith and yet such discrepancies should be impossible since those who write upon matters of revelation are denied all excuse for incertitude and variations and are indeed so remote therefrom that the very semblance is to them unpardonable when met with in profane persons who claim only their share of a weak and uninspired reason of doubt and not infallibility what does it matter the apologists go on to ask if a man is content with himself when he does not believe in a life to come it is of consequence to the peace of the present life which in such case is everything apart from immortality they continue what would the virtuous person gain by well-doing he would be the gainer by just so much as the man of virtue values and he loses only that which is unesteemed by the man of virtue that namely which your passions hanker after frequently in spite of your belief you recognize no motive apart from the hope and fear of the life beyond and yet cannot the tendency towards order be an integral part of our inclinations of our instinct even as the tendency to self-preservation or to reproduction is it nothing to dwell in the calm and security of the just in the too exclusive disposition to connect every generous sentiment every upright and pure idea with your immortal desires and your heavenly conceptions you assume always that whatsoever is not supernatural must be vile that all which does not uplift mankind to the abode of the beatitudes must of necessity abase him to the level of the brute that earthly virtues are only a ragged vesture and that a soul which is limited to this life can have only infamous propensities and shameful thoughts 
thus the just and good man who after forty years of patience amidst suffering of equity amongst rogues and of generous endeavour which ought to be requited by heaven comes to recognise the error of the dogmas which were once his consolation and sustained his laborious life with the expectation of an eternal rest the sage whose soul is nourished by the calmness of virtue and for whom well-doing is life changing his present inclinations because he has changed his system of the future and no longer seeking actual felicity because that cannot last for ever must perforce plot perfidy against the old friend who has never doubted him he must perforce be engrossed by sordid but secret devices for obtaining wealth and power and provided that he can elude the justice of men must necessarily believe henceforward that it is his interest to deceive the good oppress the unfortunate preserve only as a precaution the guise of the honest man and cherish in his bosom all those vices which heretofore he had abhorred seriously i should dislike putting similar points to your sectaries your men of an exclusive virtue if they denied the suggestion i should say that they were wholly inconsequent now we must never lose sight of the fact that inspired persons have no excuse for inconsequence and they would call for our pity did they dare to advance the affirmative if the notion of immortality has all the characteristics of a magnificent dream that of annihilation is not susceptible of a severe demonstration the good man desires of necessity that he should not perish entirely is not this sufficient ground to confirm it were the hope of a life to come indispensable to just action in this such vague possibility would still be sufficient for him who orders his life reasonably it is superfluous considerations of the present time may afford him less satisfaction but do not persuade him less he has a present need of being just other men pay attention only to the interests of the moment they think of paradise when there is a question of religious rights but in moral questions the fear of consequences that of opinion of the laws the inclinations of the soul these are their only rule imaginary duties are faithfully fulfilled by some true duties are sacrificed by very nearly all in the absence of temporal danger endow man with justice of mind and excellence of heart and you will have such a majority of the good that the remainder will be drawn to follow them even by their most direct and most material interests on the contrary you make minds false and souls narrow for the space of thirty centuries the consequences are worthy the wisdom of the means all varieties of constraint have fatal effects and ephemeral results in the last resource there must be persuasion i find some difficulty in leaving a subject which is not less important than inexhaustible i am so far from having a bias against christianity that in some sense i may be said to deplore what most of its zealots would not dream of deploring themselves i lament sincerely as they do the loss of christianity with this difference however that they regret it as it is or as it was even a century ago while for myself i do not regard the christianity of this order as so great a loss the victors the slaves the poets the pagan priests and the muses succeeded in disfiguring the traditions of antique wisdom by dint of the fusion of races the destruction of documents the explanation and confusion of allegories the desertion of the true and the deep sense in favour of absurd ideas which minister to the love of wonder and the personification of abstract beings to multiply objects for adoration sublime concepts became abased the principle of life intelligence light the eternal was henceforth the spouse of juno harmony fruitfulness the bond of living beings were henceforth but the lover of adonis imperishable wisdom was known henceforth only by the owl attributed to it the grand ideas of immortality and reward were comprised in the terror of turning a wheel and in the hope of wandering beneath green branches the indivisible divinity was distinguished into a hierarchic 
multitude actuated by sorry passions the product of the genius of primeval races the emblems of universal laws were henceforth but practices of superstition raising laughter in the children of the town rome changed a part of the world and rome suffered change herself the west perturbed agitated oppressed or menaced learned and deceived ignorant and disabused had lost all without replacing anything still slumbering in error it was astonished already with the confused noise of the truths sought by science an identical tyranny similar interests the same terror the like spirit of resentment and vengeance against the people king made all the nations kin their customs were broken their constitutions no longer existed the love of the city the spirit of separatism of isolation of hate towards strangers became weakened in the common desire of resisting the conquerors or in the necessity for assuming the yoke of their laws the name of rome conjoined all the old religions of the people had become mere provincial traditions the god of the capital caused their gods to be forgotten and the apotheosis of the emperors made even that deity pass into oblivion the most popular altars were those of the caesars it was one of the great epochs in the history of the world some majestic and simple edifice must be raised over these ruins of so many regions an ethical belief was necessary since the pure ethic was misunderstood and dogmas impenetrable perhaps but not ridiculous since the light was increasing as all worships were degraded there was need of a worship majestic and worthy of man who seeks to exalt his soul by the conception of a god of the world imposing rare satisfying mysterious yet simple rites were wanted rites so to speak supernatural but in harmony at once with the reason and the heart of man in a word there was required what a great genius could alone establish and i can hint at alone but you have fabricated collected experimented corrected renewed i know not what incoherent mass of trivial ceremonies and doctrines not a little calculated to scandalize the weak you have combined this fortuitous compost with an ethic at times false often very beautiful and in all austere the one point over which you have not proved unskilful you pass some hundreds of years in arranging all this by inspiration and your slow work repaired sedulously but faulty in its conception is not made to last approximately longer than the time that you have taken in completing it never was there a clumsiness more astonishing than to confide the priesthood to the first comers and to have a horde of the men of god a sacrifice the nature of which was essentially unity was multiplied out of all measure the direct consequences and appropriateness of the moment seem to have been discerned alone offerers of sacrifice and confessors sprang up on all sides priests and monks everywhere busying themselves with all things and everywhere also were troops of them in luxury or beggary such a multitude is said to be convenient for the faithful but it is good only in so far that the people thus finds all its requirements at the street corner it is senseless to entrust religious functions to myriads for they are thus continually abandoned to the last of men it is the compromise of their dignity the obliteration of the sacred seal in an incessant commerce the material advancement of the moment wherein all must perish which has not imperishable foundations End of section thirty